8 in the book of Luke. You know that Luke never knew Christ? Did you ever know that? Luke never met Christ in the flesh. He never spent no time with Him. He never saw Him. He wasn't one of the disciples that supped with Him and ate with Him. You may have to go back here and turn this thing down because it may get a little loud. He never had a fleshly relationship with the Master. But there was something about the Master that got his attention that he wanted to know from everybody he encountered what they knew about this man called Jesus. And it enthused him so much that he began to write about the, the what the people were saying what the Lord had done. It enthused him enough that he was willing to do a work for him. And though he had never personally ever met him, never come in contact with him, never spoke to him, never spent a moment of dinner with him, never had lunch with him, there was something about Christ that had him excited to do a work for him. Huh? So he began to talk to people and to begin to hear their insight and then he began to write about it. Now, if you begin to watch this cross up here tonight and forget about me or any other man standing on the podium tonight, you concentrate on the cross and on what God is wanting you to do. You may have not ever met him in the flesh, but are you heard enough about him to want to do something for him? Huh? Is there something that has excited you? Is there something that has come in contact with you? Have you felt an impression in your soul, in your spirit to drive you to something greater than just a man called Jesus? Huh? Something greater than just a man called Jesus. Something greater than just the little stories they're going to tell over Easter Sunday or a sunrise that they're going to get up and try to get down there because the Lord rose on Easter Sunday. They don't even have their days right. And the Bible said that when Mary got down to the grave where he was buried at in that tomb, the Bible said he was already gone. Uh, people are always trying to find God, but they don't have no idea to where to begin to look for him at. They don't have no idea where he's even presented himself at. They're always looking for him to be somewhere that's dead. I want you to know the God that we serve is not a dead God. He is a live God. Huh? And he's a God that doesn't want you to hear about him he is the master who wants to know you personally and intimately. Huh? Listen. If me and my wife have children, that meant that I know her intimately. And that means I know my children. And believe me, when I speak, my children know my voice. Huh? Now listen. My wife will get mad at our children. She'll threaten them. She'll swear up and down she's going to take something and whoop the hound out of them. She'll swear up and down that that Indian blood's going to come out in her and she's going to be on more than a war path. Huh? Bless the Lord. But when daddy speaks, I can be in another part of the house. And when I'm tired of hearing mama gripe and grumble and I speak... The children aren't so sure is daddy joking this time or is daddy serious this time? Huh? So it changes the attitude of the child. I want you to know something. We have been griping and grumbling with mama too long. We have been uh, griping about what the church is telling us to do and what we're supposed to be. That's what the church is, is mama. You understand that, don't you? 
Hi, if we be the sons and daughter of God, then we must have a mama. Mama is the church, and mama has tried to raise us. Mama has tried to talk to us. Mama has tried to lead us in the right direction. Her mama has threatened to throw us out. Mama's threatened to whip us. Mama has threatened to straighten us up, but daddy is a fixing to speak, and his children know his voice, and they don't know if he's playing or not. Well, I got news for you. Daddy ain't playing. Huh? It's a time that we get a hold of God to a place that we have never been before. Luke was a man that had heard about God, but it inspired him enough that he began to write about something that he didn't even personally know. Huh? In the eighth chapter of Luke, I want you to know that the Lord is on his way because a young lady is dying. And the Lord is on his way because a healing needs to take place. So the Lord begins to move toward that direction. Well, during that time that he's going down through there, this lady that has an issue of blood for 12 years, you know, that was a, a what, they would, what we would call leukemia now. She had an issue of blood for about 12 years, and she was so enthused about what she had heard about God, she knew that she, if she could just touch a thread... If she, she didn't even have to get a hold of God. If she could just get a piece of the clothing that was wrapped in around and about him, everything in her life would change. Huh? That's the way people are in the old times. We've been talking about this lately. What has happened from the churches of old uh, to the churches of now? Hey, it used to be they knew if they could ever get into a house of God somewhere, it would change their life. Now they just realize if they can get into the house of God, there might be a dinner plate somewhere, a hot dog supper, or something to satisfy their fleshly appetite and get them into the next day. But there used to be a place that if you could get on the inside, you could get healing for what you needed. Huh? The Bible said that a sinner cannot sit in the congregation of the righteous. Huh? Then why is our churches full of sinners? Huh? <laughs> huh? Well, I'll just tell you what brother said today. How many in here know who Satan is? Huh? How many in here? Greg knows. Huh? Well, ago, me and Brother Adam had been out. We went over to a precious brother's house today, Brother Frank Beretta. We went over there and saw him for a little bit. We was trying to get some money, but he didn't catch on to what we was over there for. So we was over there just enjoying the atmosphere. Inside of Brother Frank's house, it was so peaceful and calm. Huh? It was, it was wonderful just to get into a place that there wasn't a bunch of racket going on. There wasn't a bunch of fussing going on. There wasn't a bunch of hollering going on. There wasn't somebody trying to steal something or trying to get you to do anything. We were just sitting down and fellowshipping and having a pleasant time. So when we come back, Brother Adam, he had went to get dressed, and uh, Mom and Daddy brought me in this shirt, this real nice shirt. So I went in there, and I put the shirt on and downstairs you know if you know me I keep stuff down there to shave and to put on a little bit smell better well as I was getting out my shaving equipment and my shaving cream and my razor and all that stuff I happened to see Satan huh now you women may not know it, but downstairs in the men's bathroom there is this real huge mirror that stretches way across. Huh? And Satan gets to see himself quite often. Huh? Anybody figured out who Satan is yet? He's that fleshly devil looking back at you. Huh? 
The Bible says that the sinner cannot sit in the congregation of the righteous, so why is there sin inside of the churches today? It's because the righteous has thrown God out of the church instead of doing what God, instead of bringing in the household of faith. Huh? We have destroyed everything about this cross and put a fleshly man on it and looked at that fleshly man and said, oh, he done so much for us. We worship the flesh. Instead of the God that crucified it, said it pleased him. It pleased him to destroy the flesh. Huh? That very image. So now... Brother Adam has built this cross and if you came up and looked at it, it's got all kind of scars all over it. Got some hammer marks on it. It's got some chopping marks on it. It's got some nail marks on it. Him driving them nails in there, if you look around, it might even have a few blood stains on it. Huh? But the image that we need to be seeing on this cross is our own image. Huh? This is the image now that you need to start crucifying upon the cross. Huh? Quit trying to put God back up there. The Bible said that every time that you know him to do good, that you commit a what we call sin, you bring the cross to an open shame all over again. Huh? Sinners cannot sit in the congregation of the righteous. So what in the world are we trying to be in the house of the righteous? Huh? Brother Adam, you asked today, how in the world can we be trying to put on immortality, but yet we will not get out of the flesh? Seek you first the kingdom of God and what? His righteousness, and then all these others will be added unto you. But I asked Brother Adam this question. What's the first thing that comes on your mind when you wake up in the mornings? Boy, I wish somebody had that coffee pot turned on. Huh? Oh, I better hurry up and get to the restroom. Oh, I need about 10 more minutes of sleep. Huh? What's the first thing that comes on your mind when you come into conscious world? We ought to be like Brother Teat Wicker. We ought to be able to jump up and grab an instrument, cut us a good jig across the floor, dance before God for about 30 minutes, grab us. I don't care if you haven't got nothing but a bunch of spoons. Learn to play the spoons on your kneecap. Do what old slap that knee in that chest a little while and get something going on for God. But as I was beginning to talk about the 8th chapter, it's a brand new beginning of what is taking place in the church. Christ is on the move. The Levitical priesthood has come in. John the Baptist was a representation of what the priesthood looked like. And the Bible said that he was raggy. The Bible said he looked like a wild man. The Bible said he ate wild locusts and honey. He was not fit for anything if you looked it on him in the natural. But he was a perfect representation of what that priesthood had become. Trash but he was the greatest among all of them. That's what Jesus said. But his image that he had was the image of what the Levitical priesthood had become. But there was a new beginning coming on the scene, and that was a man called Jesus Christ that was willing to look at Satan in the flesh, crucify him, and take on the mind of Christ and do something that had never been done. And he began to do it. And in the 8th chapter we see he comes upon Jairus' daughter. He comes down through there. The woman with the issue of blood said, Oh, if I could just but touch the hem, that that wraps around him. People used to love to come to the house of God because it enwrapped Jesus. Now we can't get them in the house of God. And if we do, they can't get God in there. Huh? We're no better than any other church, no better than any other doctor, no any better any other thing in any other denomination. We can't get them in the house of God, and they don't have nothing when they do get them in the house of God. Huh? We're all going to hell. We're all cut out. We're all still caught under the law. We're all still sitting there not obeying what the commandments of God is. Huh? We have lost power in the church. And I don't mean in this building. I mean we've lost power in the church. Our electricity has gone out. Something has hit one of the power cables and has snapped the line. 
And unless an electrician comes back and can mend that line, we're going to be without power. Yeah. Huh? Come on, come that on. means you ain't going to cook. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Because women have forgotten how to cook over yeah. fires. Yeah. Huh? Come on. Him, Lord. Men are going to be the most miserable because they can't watch TV. Yeah. Huh? Young people are not going to be able to play them video games. Not going to be able to get on Facebook so they can't talk about nobody. Huh? There has come a shortage. Something has changed the power of God in our lives that the power of God, the Word of God, has become non-effect to us. So what's it going to take to mend the wire to get it reconnected, to have something, sort it back in place to make it stronger than it ever was? Brother, it's Jesus. <laughs> He's going to be the mender. That's for sure. But here, Jesus went out and he was doing the work. The woman come by there, he said, hey, who touched me? disciples looked around and said all these people and you want to know who touched you how in the world can we tell that they're all pressed around you and you worried about one person touching you he said you don't understand this one caused virtue to go out of me they were something happened and it changed the very electric current that's flowing in there. There is something somebody was sincere about getting a hold of me and it changed my molecular structure it changed the Do you know what happens? I was talking to a buddy of mine. He's dead and gone now. He said, you know something when you stick... Now, you women, check this out. He said, when you go and put something in the microwave, you know it really don't cook it. He said, it gives you an illusion that it's hot. You put it to your mouth, it's hot, but it never cooks the food. It changes the molecules in it. Huh? That's what's pretty neat. It, it means something to me gives you an illusion and that's what's going on in the churches today is it's giving you illusion but only a little bit of your molecules it's not being cooked thoroughly it doesn't have the fire to get out the impurities that's inside of your body that's causing death and hell and destruction in your marriages and everything else because there is no fire in there to drive the dross out and to get rid of there's no Holy Ghost to get a hold of you there's no sanctification anymore Huh? It used to be you had to get saved. Then, once you got saved, you had to get sanctified. Once you got sanctified, then you got the Holy Ghost. Now we get to the point, if you'll just watch television a little bit, get the Holy Ghost, you got everything covered. You don't have to get saved. You don't have to get sanctified. All you got to do is pay somebody to tell you how to speak in an unknown language. I want you to know something. If you'll ever get a hold of the real God, you'll speak in an unknown language every day of your life because your family, friends, loved ones, and the neighbors around you won't have any idea what you're talking about. Why? Because they've never heard anything about what this man spake. Never I heard a man speak like this man. When he began to speak, things inside of my life began to change. When he began to speak, uh, there was no more pain and no more suffering. And when he began to speak, my blinded eyes became open. When he began to speak, I began to hear. I was not deaf no more. Uh, when he began to speak, I finally learned a language that I could talk. Huh? What are we doing? What have we become? And where are we going? Huh? Now, Jesus walking down through there, she was, he was touched by this lady. And they began to question. He said, This one made a difference. Have you made a difference? Huh? Are you just like the good old story tales? Huh? Well, I heard about Adam and Eve. And I got them a little apple. And they ate that apple. Had them a couple of children. One was bad, one was good, so one killed the other one. Don't really know what all that meant. 
just happened. Got over there, and this man wanted to go out in a big old boat, and there wasn't no water, so God caused it to rain. He got him a big old boat, and he went out there, and he got in that boat, and he just floated around for a little while. Oh, and he did have a one or two little animals with him. Huh? Have no idea what these stories really entailed. You know where fairy tales come from. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, all oh, that lamb was sure to go. You know where that come from? Anybody in here have an idea where that come from, that story came from? That was a story that some mama told her little baby to describe the mother Mary and Jesus. And your little fairy tales began. You know where Christianity started at? In the house of God, in the house of the home. That's where things began. Her mamas began to talk to their little babies and began to teach them. You know, that song said, uh, just build my cabin next door to Jesus. Oh, my mother was the first one to tell me about heaven and the very first one, Lord, to tell me about you. But... We have taken the fairy tales instead of the adulthood learning from what's behind them and began to activate that in our lives. We rather have a story tale than have a power of God. Huh? We rather have a doctor than have a healing. We rather have a lawyer than have a manifestation of God. We rather have anything other than the power of God working every day in our lives. Huh? Thank you, Jesus. It's one thing. Well, if I can just make it till Sunday, I'll get some help then. Why not have it every day of your life? It's in you to have the authority of God every single minute of every single day. Working in you, through you, and for you. Now listen, I'm getting to chapter 9, but I want you to understand chapter 8. Jesus has been on a job. He's been on a journey. And everywhere that Jesus went, huh? Everywhere that Jesus went, he done some type of work. Casting out devils, healing the sick, opening the blinded eyes, raising the dead, opening them deaf ears, making the dumb to speak, every causing the speaking to the storms, and causing peace to come upon the face of the earth. Everywhere that our master went, he accomplished what he went to do. Now, let's go to the ninth chapter. Chapter 9 of St. Luke. Then, <laughs> uh-oh. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases and sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor script, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house you enter into, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere they went. Now we go back to what Brother Jonathan preached just a few weeks ago. Are you ready to take and pick up your cross and to follow him and put yourself upon a cross and destroy the very flesh in which you live in and begin to bear what Jesus has gave you authority to do and begin to do a work around Walton County in the state of Georgia to accomplish something unrealistic for God? Huh? 
Evidently not because didn't nobody clap their hands but one or two. There's one or two people that wants to do something for God. And out of the 22 people that we got here tonight, that's all that's wanting to do anything for God. I don't believe I had one ounce or you wouldn't have never showed up tonight. I believe that you want to do something for God to come out on a Thursday night and try to find what is God wanting to do now. He's wanting you to go to work. He's wanting you to take this power and this authority that he has placed in your life and to the people that he sent you to and get a job accomplished. He's done his work. Huh? <laughs> He's not waiting on himself no more. And daddy is speaking to the church. I told my daughter today, she was running in and out of the house. And I know that your mom and daddy told you the same thing growing up as my mom and daddy told me. They either get in or get out, but quit running in and out the door. I want you to know something, Sardis Church. Either get in or get out. I don't care which, but get in or get out. And let's do something for God. And let's make a difference in this town. Huh? Well, Greg, you ain't got nobody now. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If I don't have nobody but me and one more, that's more than God had at the end of it. Huh? But the question is, who wants to be that one? Huh? Who's willing to give it all? Who's willing to do it? Huh? Or you just want somebody else to do it. You want somebody to go out there in the parking lot and pick up the trash for you so you can turn around and tell everybody down the road, oh, I'd look at what we've been doing over there. Oh, we got a real pretty place. Well, how did it get there? Well, I don't know. Somebody cleaned up the grass. Somebody cut the grass. Somebody done it. Well, what did you do? Huh? You go to Walmart probably a whole lot more than I do because most of you got a job and I don't. Or at least I got a job and don't get paid for them. Huh? Some of y'all actually get a check. So you actually go to Walmart. When they ask you, somebody in there that you know or don't know, and they come up to you and they ask you to pray, do you have to say, well, I got to call Brother Terry and I'll get him to pray. I'll call Brother Adam, I'll get him to pray. I'll get Brother Michael to pray. I'll call somebody that, oh, I'll get one of the sisters. Me and the sister get together and I'll tell her about it and she, oh, well, she's a prayer lady we got in our church. Huh? Why in the world did God waste his time sending you down there if you want to put it off on somebody else? Huh? He gave you a cross to bear. He told you to go down there. He gave you power over the devil. He gave you power to cure the diseases. He gave you authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to take up, to bear, and to do his will. Huh? Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Huh? You know what Christ Jesus means? The anointed word. Jesus Christ means the word anointed. There's two different understandings for that. Christ Jesus means the anointed word. Jesus Christ means that word's going to become anointed. Christ Jesus means it's already anointed. Huh? And if you have the authority and you go in the name of Christ and you speak to that disease, it has to obey the word because it's his word that is given. It has nothing to do with you. It doesn't have to do anything with your life. It has to do with you believing that God sent his word and it will accomplish what it was sent to do. And the Bible said it cannot return void. Huh? So what does that mean? That means you have been given authority and power. Huh? That's what he said. You believe that? How many believe that? Huh? You really believe that? Yeah. That's good. Now, how many is willing to do something about it? <laughs> yeah. It's one thing to know how to make a good cake, and it's another thing to be so sorry and lazy you won't go out and get the right ingredients. Well, I'll just put this imitation in there. It'll work. 
Oh, man. We was talking today. You know, Brother Adam used to be over a couple of these hospitals around there. And when he was over to hospitals, he would do the ordering for the food. And he ordered real food. And that's why that people liked his cooking at hospitals because he gave them something good to eat. But just as soon as Brother Adam wasn't there, they went back to ordering frozen and imitation. And everybody knows what hospital food is like, right? It stinks. Huh? It's no good. Why? Because it's imitation. You know why there's no power, no authority in the house of God anymore? This house, not this church building, in this house. There's no authority and power anymore because I put too much imitation and false ingredients on the inside here and I'm not cooking with the real deal. Huh? Well, brother, you can't use real butter. It's bad for you. I got a dad that's 81 years old. I got an uncle that's 83. We got a man that comes and buys straw from us that's 93 years old. They still going strong. I done been in about every hospital there is around here and done everything else because I was using, quote, that good stuff for you. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. We need the real deal. We need to get back to the old-fashioned stuff. You know... There's an old song, give me that old time religion. Makes me love everybody. Hmm? Give me that old time religion. Give me that stuff that was real. Give me that stuff that, that caused my daddy to go down there and help his neighbor out. Give me that stuff that when my, my neighbors were sick, it caused me to go down there and do a day's work for them and give them the money and not charge them. Uh-oh, got quiet then. Huh? Not charge them. Give them the money that I work for. Bless God, where do you get God at in that? I get the real God. His name's Lord Jesus Christ. You got Satan looking in the mirror. Huh? The real God. The one when your neighbor's sick, you're willing to go do something for him besides talk about him. The one that you're willing to go out and fill their infirmities. Huh? The Jesus Christ that was in the sixth, uh, the eighth book of chapter Luke here was in the when in the eighth book of Luke. He was a real deal. He felt the infirmities of the people, uh, whether they were sick or whether they were dead. Huh? We got this word out here now that everybody's afraid of. It's called cancer. Huh? Everybody is scared to death of this word cancer huh when they come to Jesus in the 8th chapter of Luke there they began to mock him and they said the girl is dead huh oh it sure did scare him <laughs> it made him shake in his boots Jesus was so scared It made him so scared, he went and got him by the hand and got him out of the house. And he told the little maid, he said, Maid, arise. Huh? When you get unbelief out of the house of God, you'll begin to see the power of God come back in its place. Huh? And what does it take? It's going to take a man of God to say, Get out, Satan. Huh? You know why people cannot cast out devils anymore? Huh? Brother, he's got a devil. Lord, if it be your will, God. Lord, we don't want to stir up nothing. Uh, Lord, we don't want to cause nobody to get mad. Lord, you... We don't want sis to get up mad and she'll run out of church and she'll drag her children out of church and her husband, he'll follow her. We just got to keep our little mouth shut and just work easy with them. Yeah. Come on. That's why that devil rules your house. Yeah. Come on. Huh? Yeah. When, they, when, the, when the demons began on that island over there, after he didn't calm the sea, when they came to him and they began to say, have you, he said, shut your mouth. Huh? 
Hold your peace. Shut your mouth. Quit running your mind. The reason that there is uh, nobody casting out devils anymore because nobody has authority in their life to get the job done. They want to weasel around about it. I got news for you. Come around me. I got too much going on. There's too many people wanting me to do a job and they don't want to pay me to begin with. So I got too much work to do to play around with a stupid little old devil, cast that devil out and get on down the road and get another job done. Huh? My daddy always said, you got a car and, it's a, a, and it won't run, you can do one of two things. You can junk it or fix it. Quit your griping, quit your grumbling, and do something about it. Huh? You got something going on in your life, do something about it. Huh? Hang yourself on a cross. Hang yourself. I'll crucify you all day long. <laughs> I'm good at it. Huh? I am. You got to go to that garden. That's right. You do. But you need to crucify yourself. Oh, I can crucify you. I can get the job done real quick, but it ain't done a bit of good. You're not listening to me. If you don't listen to the mind of God, what in the world makes anybody think you're going to listen to a loud mouth country preacher? Huh? If you won't hear God speak, how in the world, or why in the world would you even think that I would think that you'd listen to me? You're not fooling me. I know your spirits. <laughs> I know your spirits when you're not here. I know you. Bells above, I know you by your name. Huh? Yeah, I just get it out right. I ain't looking nobody in the eye. But I call bells above by their name. I know them. I know the spirit that you are. I know what you trying to do but it don't work why because I'm going to have power huh I'm going to have authority my daddy said he's going to have respect he said you can give him respect in one of two ways you can give it to him because you love him or you can get it to him because he will get it huh that's the way Jesus is you're going to give him respect you can do it because you love him or you'll do it because he will put you on the flat of your back if need be. Now listen. He said he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Who did he send? I'm one. I'm one. He sent me to preach the kingdom of God. He sent me to heal the sick. He gave me authority to do this. What makes the difference is whether I'm going to do it or not. What did He send you to do? Is it any different for you than it is for me? Huh? Is it? We all got a job to do. So why not do our job? Jesus done his. Why aren't we doing ours? Who's calling and waking you up in the middle of the night saying, we need prayer? What stranger is calling you up? Boy, I used to live in the room that joined my daddy's room in his house. Huh? I know of many a nights that telephone was going off and it was people that my daddy didn't even know but they had heard about Bob McKinney and they know that if he would pray God would answer how much is your phone ringing in the middle of the night somebody asking you to pray and get the job done huh what's the difference because on the middle of the night that man was on his knees screaming out and crying to God why ain't they calling Greg in the middle of the night? Because Greg ain't crying out in the middle of the night. He's not on his knees praying. He's not fasting. He's not trying God. He's not seeking God. He's not loving God. He's trying to do an imitation of God. Huh? What's it going to take to change your life? First thing. Brother Adam asks me all the time, 
What is the Lord telling you? Huh? Is that the question you ask me? What is my answer? <laughs> I'll let you say it. I'll tell them. Get saved. Get saved or, <laughs> go, to or go to hell. So what's God saying to you, Brother Greg? I said, he said, Greg, get saved or go to hell. It was my choice. Huh? It's my choice what I choose to do. So the first thing that I would say tonight is, do you want power in your life? Do you want authority in your life? Do you want to preach the kingdom of God? Do you want to be counted as one of the two that is sent out to do a work for God? Do you want to be able to cure diseases? Do you want to heal the sick? Do you want to lay hands on them and they recover? Yes. Then the first thing I do is get saved. Huh? Yeah, uh, I got one or two hand claps. Huh? My wife was clapping because I finally said it to somebody besides her. Get saved or go to hell. Huh? Now listen, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a little bit easier on you. You're already going to hell. So won't you just get saved and change the way you're going? Huh? If we're not doing right for God, we're already going to hell. You know, it's, it, you already made that choice. So let's just get saved. So what does saved mean? It means to believe what the Word says. Huh? You know the difference... What's, you know what sin is, right? It's unbelief. So you know what salvation is? It's believing. It's the opposite, exactly. So the first thing you need to do is to get saved. Just start believing that this word is real. This is not a fairy tale. These are real. If you don't believe it, we got an extra one laying right here. I'm glad y'all didn't get rid of them. You don't believe this is real? Come up here, Brother Adam will go out and get his hammer. And we'll just use one. We'll just use one. And then you can tell me if it's real or not. Huh? This cross is real. This cross means something. It's more than just a fairy tale. Believe me, it got my attention. Jonathan didn't have to preach. Matthew didn't have to teach Sunday school that morning. When I walked in and saw that cross up here in the pulpit removed, I knew that Greg was in trouble. Huh? I knew that, Brother Terry. It didn't take no man to tell me. Just the picture of opening my eyes is all it took. So the first thing you got to do is get saved. The second thing that you have to do is to get sanctified. Now, everybody knows what that means, right? Huh? How many believes you need to take a bath at least on Saturdays? Believe me, you need to take one a little bit more often than that. Huh? Even I took one this morning. Huh? You need to take one a little bit more often than just on Saturday. Sanctification is getting cleaned up. It's washing the impurities out of your life. Well, Brother Greg, how do I get sanctified? By the washing and reading of His Word. Huh? That's what sanctification is. When you begin to study His Word with a purpose, Daddy when he was a young man and they went to the little Baptist church in Forsyth County, the Sunday school teacher would ask, who read their Sunday school lesson for this week? My daddy always raised his hand. Huh? Why? Because he wanted to be counted in with the Baptist folks that he read his lesson. It didn't matter that he read it right before he walked in the church door. He was counted in that he had read his Sunday school lesson. Huh? That's what he'll tell you now. That's not, I'm not putting off on him. I'm telling you something. 
But what changed his life is that he didn't just read the word after God got a hold to him. He began to teach us to get it out of the book and put it on the inside of you. It'll make more of a difference in here than it ever did on these pages. Now, I don't know if it's me or somebody's burning something, but buddy, I'm smelling smoke. So I don't know if somebody's burning something outside or God's creating a fire. I know I'm hot and I smell smoke. Sanctified means that you are being washed purely by the Word of God. Sanctified being cleansed, being made whole. How many has ever got an infection? Did you leave it there or did you get something to get it out? Huh? So you have to get this Word of God to wash it out of you, to get that pus out, to get that infection out of you, to get that sickness out of you, to get that that's killing you out of you. The Bible said that this letter killeth but the Spirit brings it to life. That's what's going to change it. The third thing that you must do is to get the Holy Ghost. And I don't mean jumping up and down, shaking that long hair that you cut off down to the floor. I don't mean putting on clothes that is reaching your end of your ankles and the end of your wrist and buttoning it all the way up and wearing four T-shirts under it. I don't mean wearing the slickest pants that you can buy that money has got or the finest shoes. I mean getting something that is on the inside of you that will not only make you look holy, but it will make you act holy. Huh? Now that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a doctrine of holiness. I'm talking about a spirit of holiness. I'm talking about, oh, Brother White wrote that song, oh, God, don't give me no imitations, don't give me no make-believes, God, don't give me no imposters, only give me thee. Because he said, I want the real Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost is what seals you until the time of redemption. In other words... I thought I saw you lay it somewhere. You know what this is? Bottle of water. Huh? What happened? Ain't nothing coming out of this bottle. Why? It's sealed. And when it's sealed, it cannot get out. If God has sealed you with the Holy Ghost, you can't get him out. The world can't get him out. Satan can't get him out. He is in there forever. Brother Greg, you preaching once saved, always saved. I sure am. I just believe you got to get saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I believe that 99.9% of the people don't even have no idea who God is. That's what I believe. I believe that if you're saved, if you're sanctified, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost of God, you can shake it all day long and it's not going to leak out on you. When that day comes that God is ready, He will break that seal of redemption Himself. And when He breaks it, it is for a purpose. You have reached the fullness and there's nothing. The Bible said, God, I don't pray for the world. I pray for them that you gave me. Huh? I pray for them that you gave me, Lord. He said, now I'm going to throw it. He said, them that I gave you, they're yours. Huh? I gave them to you. They're yours now. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost because you're going to need it. The fairy tale world that the church has been living in this stupor for about 40 years, 
The Bible says every time, if you'll read and study the Old Testament, every time that God would anoint a high priest, anointed now, and put him over rule of Israel, there was power in the land. There was authority in the land. There was a presence of Almighty God in the land. But when time elevated and that man was taken off of the scene, people would fall back into a stupor. They'd forget where God had brought them from. They'd forget what God had taught them. They'd forget what God had healed them. They'd forget the armies that God had destroyed on their behalf. And they'd just fall right back under idol worship. I'm telling you, believe me or not, for the last 40 years, a generation period of time, the church has been in a stupor. You see a little sporadic things along the way. You'll see one gets saved, one gets healed, one gets touched. One gets released out of jail, one gets this, one gets that. But a power and a moving of God we have not seen in the church of God. Again, not the building, His church. We're in and out of church. We can't live from Sunday night to Monday morning. We got so many preachers standing in a pulpit telling you that you got to commit a little sin every day. And you got very few that stand up, stand up and say you cannot sin because his seed remains in you. We got more telling us that go see what the doctor says. Huh? Then let's see what God says. Hey. Brother Stan, you got me being recorded, don't you? Yep. I'm standing here with my toe cut off. I let a man that I trust say, Brother Greg, that thing's got to come off. You're going to lose your whole foot if it don't come off, preacher. When if I'd have just waited and listened to God, he'd have sent me to somebody else who would have said, Oh, there ain't nothing wrong with that. A little iodine might help. We'll put some kerosene on it. We cure that. If I'd have just waited on God, then the message that I'm preaching tonight would have more power, more meaning. But I'm gonna tell you something. Just because I miss God and I got to pay the punishment for it doesn't mean that you have to. It doesn't change the message doesn't matter if I live one ounce of God or not. It doesn't change the message. It doesn't matter, Brother Adam, if I go to hell. It doesn't mean that you have to. It doesn't matter if I drink the wrong Kool-Aid. Yeah. We was talking about that today with Jim Jones. Everybody drunk the wrong Kool-Aid. Yeah. doesn't mean if I drink the wrong Kool-Aid. You don't have to. I'm telling you, this message is real. It'll change your life for the greatest. Not for the better. For the greatest. If you'll listen to it. If you'll take out of this tonight, the first night of the meeting, that Jesus has done His job, it's time for you to go and do yours. Now, what He done... He didn't send them out alone. He sent them out in pairs. He sent them out together. One thing I've been so proud of lately is the young men of this church, this body church right here, have united, Brother Terry, in a long time. Me and you crossed this old country together me and you preached together. We sang together. All right. Brother Terry, I could, 
I could be sitting there thinking about a song and Brother Terry go to singing it. His spirit and my spirit connect so well together. We've crossed the country together preaching and singing and trying to do a work for God. But what I saw in the last two weeks is a group of young men that was beginning to unite. Beginning to fall on their knees and praying for someone else. Huh? They ain't ridiculed the other man. They ain't talked about him. They haven't done nothing but got mad because of a trap that was laid. You know what? When they lay eyes on the other man, it's not going to be one ounce difference. They still going to see him as a man of God. Not just a man of God, but the man of God. They're going to not see him as a brother. They're going to see him as the brother. They're not going to see him as something. They're going to see him as he is. Huh? A son of the living God. No matter what Satan has tried to do, but what God has done. Huh? Oh, Satan does things all the time. He accuses me all the time. <laughs> I don't care. I make no better difference. I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach what, what God tells me to preach. I'm going to rebuke who God tells me to rebuke. If He tells me to take my belt off and wear you out, don't make me chase you. My daddy boy, if he ever had to chase us, it was sure enough bad news. And my foot hurts too bad to be running you down the street. Don't make me chase you. This belt comes off. Stand. My uncle was mad at me one time. And they said, he's looking for you. Now, y'all know Brother Red McKinney, right? They said, he's looking for you. The next Sunday morning, I was sitting in his living room. He said, son, what are you doing? He's always called me son. He said, son, what are you doing here? I said, I heard that you was looking for me and I know the punishment was greater if I didn't come and take it now. He said, Satan's been trying to take McKinney's out for a long time and I refuse to allow him to have you. So I'm at war with Satan. But I know to go and take my punishment. Brother Red said, stand up and take it like a man. That's just what we learned. Are you willing to stand up and take it like a man? Oh, it ain't going to be nice. You ain't going to like it. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt them feelings. Satan's going to lay a trap for you. Brother Greg, he ain't going to catch me with no woman. No. He'll catch you trying to get a dollar bill. Huh? He'll catch you out there saying you got to make a house payment. He'll catch you out there uh, trying to do something for your children, take your children to the beach. He'll do something out there. He'll find out what's your weakness and he'll lay a trap for you. Huh? He's good at what he does. But you know what is better than him? Jesus Christ. He said, there's nothing that I haven't already made a way of escape for you. Huh? He said, it doesn't matter what Satan does, what he lays out there. I told a young man the other night, I said, son, it's going to be a lot easier for you when you get the job done where you're at. When you pray, when you lead them to God, whatever, why ever God's allow you to be where you're at tonight, when you get that job done, you can come home. So go to work. You got trouble. You got something ain't right in your life. Satan laid a snare for you. You sick, hurting, got disease, family's in trouble, finances in trouble. What's he laid a trap for you? Are you willing to hang yourself on a cross? Because believe me, this young man hung himself on a cross. Jesus is wanting to put power back in your life he's wanting authority to rule and reign he's wanting that when you say 
Thus saith the Lord God that it's not a fairy tale. That's right. Huh? When your baby's laying over yonder in a car wreck and Greg's down at the farm or in a steel building and his telephone won't work, who are you going to call then to raise your child up from the dead? You don't have to call nobody but Jesus Christ. He's given you a power. He's given you authority. Activate it now. What's the sense of having a God if you're not going to activate Him and use Him? Huh? What's the sense of talking about Him if you're not going to, if you're not going to use Him? What's the sense of saying, we are the church if you're not? Huh? But if you've got something you need tonight, I'm here to agree with you. I'm here to pray with you. I'm here to anoint you. 